Hello everyone, I have the honor to have this interview with Steve Gorder today. Um, he's a world-renowned kettlebell trainer, traveling the world, teaching um, kettlebell training. And I had the opportunity to um, watch his presentation at the Functional Training Summit in Munich, Germany the other day. Um, and what really caught my attention was when he was speaking about um, the mind, the mind-body connection and how a holistic approach is important for um, our health and well-being. Um, and yes, that, that's what this um, talk will be about mainly and also um, how it relates to back pain. Um, Steve, could you please elaborate a little bit on, on, on your way to become an international trainer and I think you had back pain yourself and how you overcame that um, and also how um, maybe I think martial arts and all the Chinese um, influence that you had um, brought you to, to um, learn more about the mind. Thanks for the introduction, Ramin, <laughs> and the invitation. Yes, of course. So, really, it's this is my experience. Um, I'm not coming from an necessarily an academic point of view. Rather, uh, my philosophy is formed by my life experience more more than any other factor. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of how I've come to my uh, point of view about dealing with physical pain, such as back pain uh, a lot of it may or may not be empirical <laughs> so um, what I'm saying is what works for me may or may not work for for everyone else and as you mentioned martial arts uh, has been a great greatly impactful in my philosophy and my system with regards to movement and re with regards to mind-body interaction and um, the the basic philosophy resonates very well with me is called, uh, it comes from Taoist philosophy and it refers to the yin and the yang, the yin and the yang. It's an international symbol. Almost everyone has seen this in some form. Uh, the surfers also adapt it to represent their philosophy, which is essentially uh, the idea of polar opposites. In, so we have the, the masculine and the feminine energy that sort of form a, a uh, sphere. And it points out uh, it's not a dualistic point of view that's based on either or thinking or right-wrong thinking. Rather, it's the recognition of uh, the totality. And so that's really... Uh, I. I understood this philosophy through my exposure to Chinese martial arts at a young age. And so I've carried that into the other things that I've done, such as kettlebells. Um, you asked me how I became an international presenter. <clears throat> uh, several factors. First of all, I think the, the first factor is the development of expertise. This is something that cannot be emphasized enough, uh, especially in the modern world in which uh, from a technological point of view, things can come very quickly. And so if we don't have a personal patience, uh, if a person is impatient, it's easy to get into this habit of, I want it and I want it now. <laughs> mm. And so um, that doesn't necessarily apply really well if you're trying to develop skill. Uh, if you're trying to develop skill, it's something that is a process. And so it does take time. And I think um, regardless of how modern society becomes, there's still the value in the, the idea of the 10,000 hours. The 10,000 hours, you know, uh, 10,000 repetitions. You do it a lot from the beginning. You have to do it, you know, 10,000 is more of a frame of reference. It's not a particular number. What it means is a very long time. And mm -hmm. so lots of practice. And so you get from that, 10,000, now you're, you can say you've mastered the skill set. Now 10,000 more, okay? So it doesn't end. So, so as far as becoming international presenter, uh, it starts in a local level where a person has an interest 
in what it is they want to study, what they want to become good at, and they put in their time. And I don't know of any other way to circumvent that. Um, marketing attempts to create overnight sensations, overnight success stories. I don't subscribe to that right. at all. So, um, you know, what I've done is I studied martial arts for many years, very seriously. Uh, kettlebells came onto the horizon uh, at just a point in time when, when it was good for me. This was uh, around 2001. I started seeing advertisements for kettlebells. By 2002, I was using kettlebells, and I've been using them and teaching about them ever since. You know, so the martial art training helped me to uh, adapt to the kettlebell. And from there, I started teaching a lot of people, uh, doing seminars that came to a national level and then gradually I started getting requests from international. So I started going to different countries and teaching and over time this developed. So, um, you know, but it's not, it's not like somebody can just decide I want to do that and then they can do it. Um, anybody can do it, but you have to develop the skill. That's really what it comes down to. So that that's part of it. And then the other part is just the mindset of, um, I always saw the world as an, as a global, I never was thinking in terms of, uh, you know, being, being a U.S. citizen. I never thought in terms of just uh, ethnocentrism. I thought in terms of the whole world. And so you also, it depends on the personality. Not everyone necessarily is going to be an international presenter because they may not have a world view. They can be very successful at a local level. They can be very select, uh, very successful at a national level. And, and it's not to say that one is better than the other. It's just that it has to fit with the personality of the individual. And for me, I have always enjoyed interacting in different cultures. And, um, you know, for me, that's just been very natural and interesting. Uh, so I think, I think a person has to be interested in what they're doing. That's really important. Um, and, it, you know, we, we live in a time in which uh, it's a world-centric, it's a possibility of a world-centric view, which is that it's not your German or your French or your Spanish or Italian or, uh, okay, those are particular aspects, but as a whole, it's a human, it's a human thing. It's not based on what our ethnicity is. This is such a limiting um, you know, we're not in the dark ages anymore. So this yeah. is the 21st century. So we, we, many, most people I think, or a lot of people have moved beyond thinking in terms of just race and nations. And, um, you know, so that ties into the international aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, there's many trainers that are excellent trainers. They don't go to the international maybe because they don't have the mind to, to do it that way. And, and it's fine. Uh, because you can do a lot of good on the local level. That's where everything begins. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great story. Um, and also, um, you told me before that you had a period of like where you didn't feel that well with your body. Like you had some some pain, some some aches. Did you um, overcome it by using um, only exercises, or um, how did you how did you train? Did you do more like um, flexibility, mobility stuff, um, uh, stability, um, just general movements. Um, what do you think is most important? Um, so, so yeah, the, the backstory on that is that I travel a lot and, uh, for many years and I've been traveling extensively teaching seminars really since 2007. So this is 10 years. And, um, you know, so anyway, there's a lot of sitting on planes and uh, especially with regard to, to going a lot to Asia, going a lot to Europe. It's long periods. It's 10, to 10 hours, sometimes up to 13, 14 hours just on one flight. You know, then you go up and down. And so travelers understand that if, if people travel a lot, especially international, you're sitting in one place for a long time. And this is not it's not natural and it's not healthy for the body. And in fact, it's not just sitting, but to take any prolonged position right. um, is, is not 
ideal for our body and, and we're designed really to move and there's a mobile aspect, a dynamic aspect of our existence. So that's the backstory. I was getting a lot of compression and that combined with, then I would get off planes and often I would sometimes have to go straight to the gym and teach a kettlebell seminar, you know, which is eight, nine hours. And then again, the next day. So, so those aren't the ideal conditions for, and over time you build up uh, stiffness. And so I was suffering, uh, experiencing a lot of back pain. And so that led me to develop some techniques to, to be able to face that and correct that. Yeah. Um, so as far as what that entails, um, I don't take a purely mechanical view. There's, there's certainly a mechanical uh, viewpoint, which is a structural where, okay, you have pain here. So let's look at what's wrong here. And um, that was my initial approach as well, thinking, okay, I'm tight here. I'm always feeling. So how can I stretch it out? How can I eliminate or reduce that discomfort? And so I went very deeply into studying flexibility and really increased my, my practice of flexibility, mostly using different yoga, um, <clears throat> even some things borrowed from certain types of dance because uh, dancers have tremendous knowledge about flexibility and, and alignment. Yeah. Um, really any source, any source that offered something. Um, yoga would be sort of the, probably the large I guess categorization of different flexibility yoga has traditions that go back, you know, probably 7,000 or more years. Um, mm -hmm. So it's had time to develop a very extensive library. Um, but I don't like to use focus too much upon specific terms because uh, if somebody hears the word yoga, they already have certain preconceptions about what that means. Mm -hmm. It's based on their experience and it, Yoga can mean anything from sitting perfectly still in a meditation with no obvious movement. And it can go all the way up to doing cartwheels and handstands and, you know, uh, very dynamic movements. And, you know, depending on who's saying it and what their experiences are, they're all calling it yoga. So uh, kind of like CrossFit in the modern world. What exactly does that mean? Is it weightlifting? Is it gymnastics? You know, so... Um, it's really my own, it's my own system that I develop based on various influences. Anyone that's a good mover that knows how to teach, I will study that person and try to absorb useful things that, that now that I can use for myself. So I took this approach and over time understood how to relieve these muscles so that the flexibility and the stretching is definitely a big component. However, that's only dealing on the, on the mechanical level. Uh, there's also the mind-body, and especially in arts like yoga and martial arts and other systems, there's a strong emphasis on the breathing mm -hmm. and the harmonization between the breathing and the movement, which is key to any exercise. Um, where are you breathing? How are you breathing? Are you, are you breathing at all? Are you holding your yeah. breath? So the study of this as an ongoing, that's the highest level of any physical is actually the, the mastery of the breathing. Yeah. So it can be said, and I say, if you learn nothing else, the first technique is breathing. And if you forget every other technique, remember that technique. And that's mm -hmm. the most important. And the rest is breathing with movement. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in the yoga, you can practice. And I'm not a yogi. I, I've never... Bec uh, immerse myself in any instruction it's just i have an extensive background in movement so i can appreciate yoga in, in that sense um, but i don't i don't teach yoga and i don't consider myself a yogi um but but art such as yo yoga this emphasis on the training of the breath and the movement we can apply this in everything else we're doing weightlifting Kettlebell especially, kettlebells are big because you're, you're doing endurance, so your, your sets are going to be prolonged sets. Usually with, with kettlebell, you're not going to do five reps, ten reps, and put it down. You can use it that way, but oftentimes you're going to be working for minutes. Could be one minute, three minute, five minute, ten minute, or more without stopping, without putting the kettlebell down. So when you get into that prolonged endurance, 
the breathing is fundamental. You, you cannot be holding your breaths in, in those types of settings. If you have a heavy weight where you're going to move it from point A to point B and it may take a few seconds, okay, there the breath holding can be utilized and the consequences of holding breath is not going to be ex as extreme because the, the duration is a very short time. So even if you run out of breath, you can put the weight down and recover. Mm. With, with kettlebell, you have the weight on you for long periods. So the breathing, again, it's very precise. And so there's the stretching, there's the breathing. The mind ties with everything. So the mind is the ability to focus. Where, what are you thinking about? Where is your awareness? Mm. Um, is it outside of yourself? Is it inside of yourself? Is it in the head where it's where there's the internal dialogue where you're talking to yourself or is the mind in the body where you're feeling and observing ideally in a non-judgmental fashion? You're just observing. This is how my body feels. And now what are you going to do? How do you react? So then it goes back to the breathing. You see, so it's a, we are a supercomputer. Mm. So there's all these different parts moving. The mind is basically what directs the program. Mm. So we have to look at the movement itself. This is alignment. This is posture. This is the, the, the way of moving. There's the breathing. There's the focus, concentration. There's many ways you can, you can say it. Uh, so all of this ties together. And actually... When we understand that, there's not a particular technique because there's many techniques that can accomplish objectives. Techniques are many. Principles are few. Mm. So we focus more on the principles and then we can apply it to whatever technique uh, we want to study. For me, I figured out where am I tight and, okay, what positions can I adapt which gives me relief? Now, if you can find relief, there's hope. If you get a little bit of relief, you start to have more confidence that, okay, maybe I tapped into something that it gives me hope to think that I don't have to live with this pain forever. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, it hasn't felt this good. I don't remember the last time it felt like this. So then you can go further. And, you know, after a while of tinkering, I find out positions, okay, I need and sometimes you still have a hard time through the, through the stretching because the stretching is mechanical. So even if you become very practiced, even an advanced person that's very good at stretching, there may be certain ranges of motion that they haven't figured out how to get to. Mm. Right? So you can look at technology. Is there some technology? There's a tool called stick mobility. Mm. This is a new tool for stretching. You saw it at Perform Better right, yeah. uh, in Munich. Uh, that's an example of a tool where technology is, okay, I'm not able to stretch this area with the stick. Now I can get into certain areas that I couldn't before. Still dealing with the mechanical. And so the, the, the missing piece to that, what I found is ultimately it comes down to the mind itself. And now I'm not even really so concerned about the body because the body actually is just going to follow the, the directions from the mind. Mm -hmm. So the, the final piece to that for me is the recognition it, within our mind is where am I holding tension? Mm -hmm. Because the tension is now stored in the body and it manifests itself as things like pain, discomfort. And then if it's chronic, now it's there all the time. If it's acute, it might be very sharp or very intense for a period of time and, and then with alternating waves of uh, more or less sometimes it bothers a person sometimes it doesn't right mm -hmm. so um, I realized that we actually hold certain patterns which can manifest themselves so we call it pain and if we're approaching it from a physical perspective a mechanical perspective only like I go to the doctor and I say, doc, my shoulder's bothering me. He says, oh, well, worst case scenario, he wants to cut you or he wants to give you some drugs and keep you on those drugs, right? Mm -hmm. Best case scenario says you need to do these exercises, you know, but at the end of it, 
my belief also it's traditional the doctor does not do the healing the healing occurs within the body the doctor can at best facilitate the healing mm. sometimes it's just by saying a word and giving you confidence so now okay the doctor says i'm not going to die so i feel better so now you can start healing yourself so honestly a doctor has to play tricks just like a trainer has to play tricks because it's all about the mind and getting the person to initiate the healing process because if I don't believe that I can get better, I've already set up a mental block. So there's no procedure or medicine that is going to enable me if I refuse to heal, if I refuse to allow myself to move beyond whatever pattern. Okay, and so, so we hold this pain and we hold pain in our body. Mm. And the mechanical view says, oh, I, I stubbed my toe, I hurt my toe. Well, that's because your toe banged into that thing. Yes, that's true. I can't argue with that. It's empirical. However, there's something maybe that is causing me to continuously stub my toe. Yeah. And it's like a computer program that's being run, but I don't even realize it's being run. And so it just keeps going and I keep stubbing my toe. And then I keep getting medicine to put on the toe until it heals. But it does not address the underlying cause. So mm. I'm focused on the causal, not on the effect. So probably you would have to have a strong enough reason to heal also. Maybe that's a reason some people, they say they want to heal, but then Correct. maybe because they're doing the same thing over and over again, it's not what they subconsciously like really want to because maybe Correct. they have some um some benefits from from not healing as well uh, it is benefits absolutely yeah. and uh we we stay at the level that of our comfort and so this this term comfort zone yeah is a big is a big thing about right. recognizing where we are and then we make decisions about if we're comfortable staying there or if we want to move And so in the moving is the discomfort because we have a homeostasis, which we adapt to. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes the pain is less scary than the possibility of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And the unknown is where we have to go to get past because the pain is the program that's being run currently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so how I like to say it is that we exist in the space and if you can, You can imagine like it's an invisible cube or any shape, okay? But you have this space that we exist inside of and we grow. Sometimes the growth is very slow and it doesn't seem like we're growing at all. It can seem like we're getting smaller, but we're still expanding because that's the nature of the universe. And so we stay in that space until we fill out the space. And then when you fill out the space, a new space becomes available and, and now we start to grow into that. And again, and so the procedure can continue indefinitely. You outgrow one and now you're in another and you stay in that other until you, and all the different things in our life, life lessons, pain is definitely a part of that. And pain is not the problem. Pain is the friend. So yeah. love the pain, embrace like the pain. And, yeah. you know, and there's a learning because we don't, when we're comfortable, We don't learn. We like to be comfortable. Yeah. The martini, the hot shower, all the things that make us feel nice and good. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. That's a part of the, the yin and the yang. But only that is going to cause imbalance. And so when we don't feel so good, the cold shower is actually good for us. You know, the failure, the missed shot is actually good for us because it's what enables us the opportunity to grow into a new space, which is progress. And the same is true with the physical pain. We can actually, instead of resisting it, we can identify with it. Okay, I'm, I'm having discomfort here. And step away from it, try to understand it. Why? Why am I holding? What am I holding? And Things like therapy, sometimes it's difficult to develop the self-awareness. It takes time to where we can objectively. And so things like therapy, therapists, people that can listen and help us identify things that we are not 
identifying by ourself yeah. that can get that can help to illuminate but ultimately self awareness is paramount to be able to overcome obstacles uh whether it's physical pain or some other the physical pain is the least you know it depends on i think for most people emotional pain is much more uh mm. impactful mm. and much more painful uh than um you know if someone that has a lot of emotional pain they would probably gladly trade that for a broken arm or a broken leg mm, you know so yeah. um but at some level it's all connected sometimes it expresses itself as a physical but it may not be caused by the physical it can just be depositing itself there mm. like like pollution at the end of a of a river it just kind of the, the trash just kind of piles up because that's where it stops but it doesn't necessarily come mm. from that it comes from so upstream yeah and um i i see i see things this way and this is how i apply it for yeah. myself and um it enables me to to stay pain free because even when there's discomfort you learn not to uh hold on to it and take it personal you just recognize it as some imbalance because the natural condition is health the natural condition as well is yeah. to be well and if we not feeling that it's because we are have some absence or we were somehow removed mm. uh from that so we can find the balance everything tends to work correctly yeah yeah i like that um uh, i i think uh the same with my pains that i had and and if i have some discomfort sometimes i feel like okay this is telling me something and that's fine like that's that's it um, and i'm not getting emotionally attached with it um and then but I, what i also see is um and maybe you you would agree that when you then um work on your body you do movements you do maybe some fascia work or or have a therapist um releasing some tension in your body whatever that can also have an influence on your emotional um life right absolutely absolutely so it goes both ways it's um yes and a therapist has to be um also knowledgeable about a therapist especially manual where they're doing a lot of physical touching they mm. absorbing energy from the patients mm. and um depending on the therapist and what level they're working on um some therapists will work with people that have tremendous trauma mm. and the therapist can end up feeling the negativity and it can actually cause them health problems mm. and so there's also has to there's techniques and ways that it, it grounding techniques where you have to be able to un unload or deload the what you're absorbing because there's nothing for free in life it's not just you the person comes and they pay you and you give them the massage or the or it's a discussion a therapy this way different kinds of therapy um it's not like it's just they pay you and now you have the money and no it doesn't stop there it continues because there's an exchange and there's the invisible part the invisible part is actually the more permanent part Mm. So um and then sometimes the therapist will start feeling maybe they see their health deteriorate or they feel agitated or and maybe not making the connection that there might be just one particular patient that has a lot of quote unquote baggage. Yeah. And so one of the reasons they're coming is you make them feel better. How do you make them feel better is because you're taking some of their baggage off of them mm. and putting it on you. Right. Right. So even if you're charging 300 or 500 euros an hour yeah. it's not enough because that's going to do you far more than 500 euros right. of damage that's not allow it to yeah. become a part of yeah so this is a, another the unseen part you know and um yeah in ancient medicines you're also trained in like like holding trees and doing simple meditations where you're touching a tree that's a way you can ground yourself or if there's no tree sometimes you have to do it to a wall you you get rid of that you know because we don't know the other person's story some right. stories are very intense mm. 
you can see people from the military that have seen things that we can't imagine in the, you know, horrific things, right? So that becomes a part of the psyche of the, the imprint imprints on the DNA. And, you know, so different kinds of therapy it goes way beyond somebody, a, a little kid falling off his scrape, skateboard and, and scraping up his knee. And now you got to dress his wound. There's almost no emotion, you know, severe emotional energy associated with that because mm -hmm. kids heal quickly. But for someone that maybe has a lot of abuse and things like that, that's a totally different story. And there's a lot different kind of energy associated with, with that story. Right. So, um, it's a, you know, I learn I study more about these things now because ultimately all the training, I don't work on the therapy side. I will, I, but also I'm, I was exposed to that in my martial art training. We also study the traditional certain traditional medicines, which was more for the martial art, which is dealing with physical. So the use of herbal liniments to expediate, you understand the martial arts being thousands of years old. Yeah. This predates the advent of firearms and missiles. And, you know, people wow. were fighting with handheld tools, swords and knives and sticks. Mm. So in the battlefield context of ancient times, if you had injury, you couldn't take, you know, put it in a cast and take six weeks to let it heal. You had to get back into it now. So the, the herbs and the medicines were to expedite the healing process so you could be battle ready. Yeah. You, you know, so the bone setting, you, a shoulder comes out of place, you have to learn how to put it back in. And the massage, this is called the, the, the hit. It's called the hit medicine. Mm -hmm. So this was part of the, of the traditional Chinese uh, martial arts study is learning also the massage. And so I used to do a lot of that. Now I don't do any of that. I never, never wanted to get into the licensing or go that path. I went more into the training, the mm. physical skills, you know, the exercise, the fitness and, you know, however, regardless of, and some do, some do both there. They have a, you may be doing massage and personal training, for example, where you're bringing, yeah the therapy with the physical training. Um, uh, but, but the point of it is, is that um, with, with all of this, it's really all about the mind yeah. more than the body, um, whether someone is aware of it or not, because when you're doing the repetition of can be anything, push-ups, you're developing the focus. Mm. And so eventually you get to the recognition that everything is mind mm. because when you're highly trained, all you have to do, your mind just gives a command and the body can do it. You've done it already 20,000 times. So you can always do it. It's a part of, it's just a movement pattern. Yeah. The beginner has to create inertia and momentum to get their body moving in that direction and then learn to control the forces. But that's over the, the first weeks and months and years. And then after a while, you know, so when you see, we watch the Olympics and we see a, a world-class gymnast, they make the difficult look simple. It's because it is simple for them, for them yeah. because they patterned it and they could just as well do a backflip as you can brush your teeth. It's yeah. really that simple. And for any, any mover of any, it's the, the, the techniques that you've practiced and the movements. Now you take that gymnast off the balance beam and you put a few drinks in them and you put them out Saturday night, they may be extremely awkward and not <laughs> graceful, right? So yeah. it's another question whether you can apply your skills to other areas. So yeah. sometimes it's just the specialization. But regardless, it's the mind. You're training the mind. Yeah. And this is my... This is part of my contribution and part of my um, interest in the fitness community is to have more educators understanding and speaking about the mind and working on the level of the mind because otherwise you're at some level you're wasting a lot of time. Yeah. The, mus the body is going to age. The muscles sure. you know, will yeah. reach a physiological peak. So you have to I, cultivate more than just yeah. the physical. Right. 
I agree totally with that. Um, we need to see more people um, being more mindful in their training because um, like the general population, when they sit all day for eight hours, 10 hours, whatever, they, and they go to the gym and they have a crazy training, they train hard, they w just want to get out, the, out of their bodies, um, but they are far from being mindful and, and, and doing the exercises uh, with, yes. with uh, mindfulness. And I think that's what's really important for whatever um, fitness um, approach or training approach. Um, that's the, 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 missing, the missing key, uh, I would say. That, uh, yeah. An intelligent approach is, is to yeah. assess, assess the situation and have a multi-tiered yeah. There's preparation. So if, if the reality is that you're sitting in that office chair for eight, 10 hours or, or riding the train or driving, you know, maybe you're in a seated position 10 hours or more, not including the time spent at the dinner table or on the toilet or maybe yeah. sitting in front of the TV. So potentially 16 hours in a day or more in a seated position. So yeah, you don't just walk in and start banging out reps. You need to prepare you know, mobilize, start loosening the body, then, you know, and it's really important otherwise. And, and so the intelligent approach is to uh, assess the situation on a case by case and not, not follow a template where you're just doing things mindlessly um, because you're not going to ultimately get the, the benefit out of that. Yeah. Yes. But like you said, it all starts with, um, with your mind and also with um, like your beliefs and, and you're willing to change and you're willing to, um, to get healthy. And um, do you have any like, tricks or any ideas on how we can teach people um, to um, become more mindful and to really um, be willing to change and to get out of their comfort zones? Or, is it just an individual um, um, approach that you have to find with, with that certain person? Quite an interesting question and important yeah. question. And all I can do is share my experience in there. And, and I, I suppose if we have the answer to this, we can figure out the rest. Um, in a word, it's not a trick. Maybe, maybe it's, it's wisdom. I, I don't know. Maybe it's ancient knowledge. Maybe it's truth. Um, I would say the fundamental thing is that the duality is an illusion and the unity is a reality. And so moving away from a dualistic way of thinking and moving into a, a unified way of thinking um, really is the, the solution. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, again, you mentioned the word beliefs ties into education, educational systems, uh, patterns, patterns of operation. Um, it relates to society, it relates to culture, it relates to family, it relates to tradition. Mm -hmm. It manifests itself as beliefs of the individual and so the beliefs become a culmination of different experiences things we are told things we have seen things we have been exposed to and we formulate beliefs based on that and that shapes the worldview and it shapes the self-concept as well and depending on what those series of experiences are the beliefs can be empowering and they can be disempowering and if we're moving in a direction that we're, you know, and even what I'm saying here has to do with the belief because this is what I believe and this is my experience. And I can say I know it. However, it's, I just know it for me. It's not me knowing it, saying that it's my position to tell somebody else how to live because it isn't. So, uh, again, the yin and the yang, the dualistic is an idea of, right, wrong, good, bad, God, devil, male, female, sun, moon, mm. uh, hot, cold, and so on. It's seeing it as separate. Um, Christian, Muslim, German, Austrian, mm. either or. Um, this is a dualistic view, and the dualistic view keeps a person divided. 
because it creates, it starts from the way that we view things. If I see the world as good, bad, right, wrong, God, devil, then of course I have to be right, which means you must by default be wrong Mm. because I see the other and I see you separate from myself. So it's, and actually, um, now that I'm busy seeing the differences in you, I'm not focused on what's really important, which is living. And so if I am distracted by the fact that you have different color hair and different color eyes and you have a different passport and maybe speak a different language and maybe have a different religion and maybe you have a different economic standard or drive a nicer car or Mm. or I don't like someone that you know and or maybe I think your job is beneath me right so there's all these differences and I'm so distracted by this so it's hard to be whole when you're all broken into different pieces so instead recognizing that the division is simply begins in the viewpoint and when I see the one the unity Um, When I realized that peace is actually this, and this is not peace, this is the war sign, this is the, because it's been distorted. And actually the two now becomes the one, and now we understand that it's just the perception Mm. of the difference. And actually there's not any difference, it's just that, we have personality. The universe expresses itself in many ways. This is part of the diversity and it's all good and it's all beautiful. And yes, it's different, but it doesn't make it right or wrong. It just makes it so. And this is really the the whole crux of it is because when I understand this unity, I also start to see the pain as the friend Mm. and the discomfort as the teacher. And when I, can recognize it. I don't fear it. And then I can embrace it. And in embracing it, it becomes, it's no longer the thing that I'm afraid of. And, and so now I don't have the pain anymore. I am the pain. And mm. when you're that, you don't fear it. You can function within it. Um, so all this, the mind, the body, the breath, it's all working together. And something I, I heard recently, I've always known, but I only heard it recently. And as soon as I heard it, I, now I adapt it because I recognize it. It's, and, and basically what it is, is that many people operate as if thinking that we are a body that has a soul, when the reality is we are a soul that has a body. Mm. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And so it's taking care of the soul and worrying less about the body. Um, the body is like the car. We have to take good, good care of it and keep it in good working order so that it can bring us from point A to point B. And we can do our work and do the things we're here to do. But, but we, we don't identify by the car as if the car is who we really are because you're so much more than the body of the car. And even if it's a really nice car, even if it's a Ferrari and you're proud of it, if that's all you are, well, eventually the car is not going to drive anymore. So they're, right. you're missing out on a lot of life. And um, physical beauty is just one part of who we are, but it's not the only or most important because that's, that's still operating from a dualistic. If I care so much about how I appear to you, mm. it means I'm focused on you. Mm. and actually the focus is on in and to focus within the self now we can truly be selfless when because you know who you are so you can be more kind to other people and be more loving and be more helpful and use some of that enormous strength to help lift somebody up that maybe doesn't have a lot of strength of their own at that moment and uh, this is the real application of you know, it's not about just building the biceps or moving heavy weight. Not to, not for me. Mm. Um, I see the strength as something that contributes to uh, society. Uh, 
making a better, truly creating a better existence. Yeah. Uh, by making more informed choices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I remember you were talking about um, gratitude as well and um, being also like a key for our well-being. Um, you, you, you have a gratitude list that you, that you write every day and do, would you think that... I don't do it on a list. It's not a okay. list. It's just going I'm through your sure, mind. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that that's an exercise that can be very, very beneficial. Um, yeah. You know, definitely also writing... For- Yeah, writing is, is good. And so for anyone that, that chooses to do that, I, I can only encourage and, and think. And, and I would also benefit by writing. However, um, you know, I also believe in the oral traditions. And, you know, before there was written, written knowledge originally was not in written form. Um, the, the early tribes were basically illiterate in that sense. And mm. the teachings were done through oral tradition also. So yeah. if, if we go back through ancestry when we were just living in caves, it was the oldest wise person in the, of the tribe would be telling stories around the campfire. And this is how the children learned about the world. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, yeah. And then certain people started writing scribes and so on. Mm. I'm not an anthropologist in terms of a scholar or historical scholar, so I'm sure someone that's really educated in that could, could – give more details. Um, from what I've read, I think that the dervish were some of the early scribes, uh, you know, like in modern day India, that part of the world, that's a very ancient culture. So, um, yeah, I don't know what the first language, but Sanskrit probably is one of the first recorded written languages, you know, so even before the first written, you know, so for me, really, you can think about it. You don't have to write it. The writing is a, is a practice. It's to get it out of the head and put it so that you can focus on it. But in some way, it's also a step that doesn't necessarily need to be taken because you can just think about it. Does that make sense? Sure, so, sure. So I, yes, don't, I don't keep a list. Yeah, yeah. Keep a list, but, but you do it every day like, um, yes, before you go yes. to bed. And, um, yeah, yeah and or it, sometimes not. And then I, if I think of it, I remind myself, you know, remember to. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, it's like any discipline, it's, there's discipline and then there's those that are disciplined. Disciplined is like a ritual where you practice, you know, whereas there's different degrees. So for me, it's something that I'm mindful of, Mm. but it's not something that I do as like a routine. Oh, I see. So discipline would be a routine that you do every day. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, depending on, again, it's something that it can mean different things. If someone thinks of yeah. discipline, a lot of times you would think of a military, a military yeah. officer. We'd say that's a disciplined person. I have you to really, do it. Of that kind of discipline, it's a routine. Every day at, you know, at 0500, up and out, you know, you're lacing your boots and you're, you know, and if that might include a cup of coffee, you know, at a certain time in the reading of the paper, but you're going through and every day you do this and then repeats. That's not how I live. I respect it. Mm. I live is what do I feel like doing at this moment? What seems like, you know, what's yeah. so, um, but I dis- same- yeah. So, 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 but basically start the day, start the day. What comes into your mind? Yeah. That's where, where I'm practicing the gratitude. So, yeah. You know, because, and more so when I don't feel, more so when I feel like, you know what, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't, I don't want to mm. do this thing that I'm scheduled to do, <laughs> yeah. um, teach a class or whatever it is. You know, I just want to do nothing. So if you have the luxury of doing nothing, it's one thing, but a lot of times you don't. You have to do something. You, you, you made a commitment. And you yeah. feel like you don't want to do it, but you know you have to. So mm. um, that's where the discipline comes in and things like that. Mm. So, um, you know, but again, it's lifestyle. There's so much differences in lifestyle. Many right. people have routines. My routine is very dynamic. Yeah. Because, I'm, I, because my main work is in seminars. So if I have a seminar scheduled, that's – It's very regimented in that sense. 
Mm. But when I don't, that's my recovery. So mm. for, for maybe someone that has a traditional corporate structure, it's a Monday through Friday and then the Saturday and the Sunday. And the yeah. Saturday and the Sunday is the family day. So if you're going to church, that's the day you go to church. That's the day you have the Sunday family brunch. You know, whatever. I'm not judging any of it, but it's just when you talk to people and you see people around the world, one thing that I start to understand is there's really no such thing anymore as the conventional, you know, like generationally, the generation now is so incredibly and vastly different yeah. than even two generations ago. Right. You know, whether you come from America or whether you come from Germany and it's like, because like when I was a kid, when I was, you know, growing up and, 70s i was born in 1970 so there was still a, a a kind of a you could give an idea of what a typical american family would do in a day and you know and and pro definitely for germany and from places around the world but now that's not so and i'll give you a perfect example i was in barcelona teach uh teaching a they say a presentation uh, for a group called mind valley and it was uh, about two weeks before I saw, saw you in Germany. And um, I would sp speak to people, and it was a conference, uh, Mind Valley University, where there was people coming from different places around the world that were staying there for a one-month immersion. And, uh, immersion. Mm -hmm. and so I would ask many of them, where are you from or where you live? And for the most part, most of them, their answer was that they didn't live anywhere. Their answer was that they were a citizen of the planet or they didn't have a home or they were living in Barcelona for this month, something like that. It was wow. noncommittal. It wasn't like I live in this city. You want mm -hmm. one couple, every other person asked probably 15, 20 people, you know, cause I'm, when I meet people, I'm curious. I like to know where they are from or, or, you know, usually uh, when I go into a city, especially I've never been, the taxi driver is a great source of information. So if they yeah. speak a little bit of English, yeah. um, that's where I start rattling off their quest questions. You know, yeah. politics, it depends how long the, the, the car ride is. You know, but basically I like to ask questions of people, learn about their culture because a lot of times I'm not there for long. I might be there for a weekend seminar. Mm. So I try to get more info that... For me, it, Wikipedia is a good source, but when you can talk to people, that's a better source. Yeah. Because you get their point of view on what it's like to exist there as a, as a citizen. Right. And to me, the taxi drivers are like really important people in the world because you can get things from a taxi driver you would never get and save yeah. you so much time. Don't go there, go there. <laughs> right. So anyway, the point is, is that now, you know, uh, with things like Uber and, and Airbnb, for example, mm. and e-commerce and Google and all these things, a person actually doesn't have to use a traditional model anymore. You don't necessarily have to go to school so you can go to university so you can get a degree so you can get a job so you can get the house. You can do that. And maybe, maybe many people, their parents did it that way and their grandparents did it that way. And so we assume by default that we're supposed to do it that way, but we don't necessarily have to do it that way anymore. We can pave our own way. And so we're meeting in your generation. I'm like at the upper limit of that. I'm 47. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what your age is, you know, but, the, you, but yeah. yeah, so, so you're kind of in the middle of that, but the yeah. ones that are, the generation, but you know, like, like the, the 18, 20 year olds now, right. they're going to be driving flying cars or riding in flying cars when they're the ones that are really making the economic decisions when they're my age, my kids, when they're my age are going to be in driving cars for example, flying cars, for example, the world's totally different now. So, so basically with the app and what's maybe going to become the wearable and what maybe is going to become the chip. I don't really know. I'm not, a, I don't control that. I'm not on the cutting edge of that. There's people that are, 
Yeah. I just happen not to be one of them. <laughs> I'm not a tech guy, yeah. but I am a guy that maybe a few years later, I'm not the early adapter to be the first guy to get the next iPhone. I'll come in maybe a little bit later, but eventually I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go and I'll use it to the best of my knowledge. Mm. You know, like, like we met like Facebook and these types of things, right? Like I, some people they're there at the beginning and then it takes a while for the rest. I'm not like the last guy to find out and I'm not the first guy to find out. I'm in that middle pack that yeah. eventually will adapt the smartphone. Right. So, but as time goes on, those changes become faster and faster. Yeah. You know, uh, from internet yeah. to, to app was a lot faster than from computer to internet. And, you know, so, so people have to be more flexible. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's a different world. Yeah. It's world centric. It's not egocentric. I just yeah. care about me and it's not ethnocentric. I just care about, you know, America first or Germany first, right? This is archaic worldviews mm -hmm. and they appealed to certain needs at certain times. But, you know, um, now it's different. Now we can communicate via Zoom. Yeah. You're in Germany. I'm in Italy. I'm an American. You probably have different ethnicities coming, but you're li right. So um, <laughs> this mindset, if people that have a mindset of like, it's very outdated, no offense to the person, but the world has changed whether you like it or not. That's really what I'm yeah. saying. And so I think it also comes back to the comfort zone. Um, that yes, people absolutely. Like to stay in a comfort zone and everything new is first. It's a challenge. It's like you you don't know it, so maybe it's it's harmful or whatever. And if you don't have a like a mindset that you approach and embrace uh, new things, then you might not be as flexible, and and that is what will create stress um, in your life. Correct. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Fear right. of the unknown. It really comes yeah. back to the fear of the unknown and, yeah. and embracing change, embracing challenges. Yeah. Great. Um, so your, are there any final suggestions that you um, would have for people who want to live a pain-free life, who want to live um, a healthy life and who want to live up to their fullest potential? Um, Yeah. Absolutely. The only suggestion I can possibly give is to uh, love more, love yourself, mm. uh, accept yourself and forgive yourself and realize there's only one of you and you're perfect exactly the way you are. Nobody could be you but you and nobody could do a better job of being you. And so we don't, again, dualistic, I'm comparing myself to somebody else. I feel inadequate because they have a nicer car or they're taller. Mm. Uh, unified is I respect that person for, for themselves and I'm happy and celebrate for them that they have their life. And, you know, for me, I'm very fortunate to have my life and my experience and whatever difficulty I'm having at this moment, it's the opportunity for me to grow. And I know that, uh, I'm capable. I have the, the, potential within me to resolve this, even if I don't have the solution right now. Maybe I don't know at this moment how I'm going to get through this difficulty, but I trust because I know that I would not have been presented with the difficulty if I didn't have the capability. So again, in breathing, the technique is to breathe and stay calm. Is always breathe, stay calm, love yourself, forgive yourself, accept yourself. Really, and, and with that, Okay, now it's like, okay, so I'm not tall. I'm not going to play in the NBA. I can accept that. Mm. You know what? I'm not a supermodel. I'm not going to go down the catwalk. I can accept that. But if I really want to go down the catwalk, I can yeah. get myself and I can still do it if it's important. Yeah. So decide what's important to you. Don't waste time on unimportant things. On some fantasy. You don't, you don't have to play football for Bayern Munich. Maybe you're not good enough. And maybe at the end of it, you don't love the game as much to where you're going to make yourself good enough. So just right. accept that, Yeah. you know, and at the end of it, it doesn't really matter because there's so many other parts of you that you can develop, you know, and, and because society says you're supposed to be that, that's unimportant what society says about you. It's only important 
how you feel about yourself and you want to feel good about yourself. You want to love yourself and forgive yourself and accept yourself. And that's the only advice I can ever give because without that, everything else is, is really temporary. You know, like I can teach someone a tech. I only know how to teach you kettlebells and body weight and I can teach you breathing, but I can't make you do any of it. Mm. I can only expose you to it. So that's what teachers are for is to expose someone. The work is we have to do it alone. Yeah. You know, and so if we just can accept ourselves, we, we develop a certain faith that there's a belief, a fundamental belief that um, I know that I can do it. I know that I can do it and I know that everything's going to be, a, be good. Mm. Um, and, and that's right. really helps with all the other stuff that we've been talking about, the pain yeah. and um, stop fighting, stop resisting. Yeah. Just be be at peace and, and, you know, practicing gratitude again, it's a technique because ultimately we are grat- gracious at every moment mm. um, when, when we understand that life is a gift and the rest is perception. If we see something as bad, it's because we're perceiving it as bad. It does not make it bad. Mm. Um, the pain is also good. The suffering is also good. It's a part of the growth and, you know, to deny to deny that is like denying the rain is to believe that the rain is bad and the sun is good. And if you believe the sun is good and the rain is bad, then most of your life, there's going to be a lot of bad in your life. And you're going to keep seeing it that way and keep having a, an experience that doesn't feel good to you. Instead, we go out into the rain and we realize the rain is not going to hurt me. In fact, now that I think about it and I take a moment and just relax, I actually really like the rain and it's really feels wonderful. And my whole life I was thinking it was bad. And now I realized that my attitude was bad and actually the rain is really good. And this is the, the philosophy and all of those things. And in exercise, you can use it to push yourself to do that rep, not because you have to, but because you choose to, you know, and, um, We make mistakes all the time. We make missed shots all the time, but don't make that, don't make that discourage you to stop playing. You keep playing, keep trying the shot. You're going to make the shot. (laughs) Michael Jordan missed a bunch of shots too. Yes, he did. He was the best ever. So, you know, that's a good example for us to follow. If you want to use a sports analogy. Yeah. Great final words. Um, I thank you so much for the interview. Um, Thank you for your time.